Hello, Mrs H here. This is a walkthrough of the 2019 paper two. I've divided it into three manageable parts and this is part two of three. As I've said before, it is a difficult paper and it can seem a bit daunting, but please don't forget to look at the grade boundaries because they are quite generous. Question three, phototropism is a growth response by part of a plant to light. Name one other tropism, give the stimulus the plant responds to in the tropism you have named. So I'm going to go with the tropism of geotropism, which is also known as gravitropism, and the stimulus is gravity. 3.2, we've got to plan an investigation to show the effect of light from one direction on the growth of plant seedlings. Include details of any controls needed. You may use some of the equipment shown in figure four and any other laboratory apparatus. So have a look at our equipment. Our independent variable is going to be the direction of light. So we could put some seedlings in a box, put the lid on and cut a hole in the side. We could shine the light in one direction. The dependent variable is going to be measuring the height of the seedlings and we could observe any bend because we know phototropism seedlings are going to grow towards the light that's what we expect to happen anyway we're going to need to think about our control variables so what are we going to keep the same because we're going to have to do repeats we will need to control as well because if we are planning an investigation to show the effect of light from one direction then we need a control to compare that with so we need seedlings that are not exposed to light in one direction so what we could do is we could put a pot of seedlings in the box in the dark and compare those with seedlings that are being shone on in one direction so let's write our method down then use two boxes use the scissors to cut a hole in one of the boxes the hole should be five centimeters from the top of the box and 10 centimeters in diameter so we can use the ruler for that this will allow the light from the lamp to enter the box in one direction. We'll use two pots, each containing 10 seedlings planted in the same soil type. So we're talking about our control variable here. Use a ruler to measure the height of each seedling and calculate the mean starting height of the seedlings in each pot. Place one pot of seedlings in the box with a hole in the side and put the other pot in the box with no hole in the side. Place the lids on each box. Place the lamp by the hole and switch it on. Leave the seedlings to grow for 48 hours. Ensure both pots are watered with the same volume and kept at the same temperature. So we're keeping our control variables the same there. They're both going to grow for 48 hours. After 48 hours, we're going to use the ruler to measure the new heights of each seedling and calculate the mean growth per pot. Then what we can do is compare the mean growth of the seedlings exposed to the light from one direction with the mean growth of the seedlings that were kept in the dark. So that is our control pot. Also, we can make a note of any bend in the seedlings. We could measure the angles using a protractor, for example. Then what we do is we just simply repeat that experiment a further two times, and then we've got a set of three results. Lovely jebly. Six markers can be pretty intense and I just wanted to quickly show you the mark scheme for this six marker. You could have had different ideas about how you would do the experiment to what I suggested and you can still get the six marks. You just need to make sure that your method design caters for all the points. So for six markers, the examiner reads through your whole answer first and then they get a general feel for which level it is. Of course, we'll be aiming for the top level. So have a look at level three. The method would lead to the production of a valid outcome. So that means that you need to have identified control variables. Your independent variable needs to be clear and your dependent variable, uh, you need to talk about repeats. And if we look 
down at the bottom of this mark scheme, you can see that it says, for a level three, a reference to comparing the growth of plants with light from one direction with plants either in the darkness or in full light. We did the one in the darkness along with a control variable. So if you haven't said any of those, you can't get the level three. And we have mentioned those. We spoke about the soil type being the same, leaving them for the same amount of time, same volume of water, same temperature. We definitely had this covered. Then you can check whether you've included the indicative content. You don't need to have said all of these to get the six marks. One pot of seedlings in each batch, several seedlings. Yeah, we used 10 seedlings per pot. Measure the heights of each shoot. Yes, we did that, etc., etc. I'm not going to go through the whole mark scheme. We've definitely covered most of the points on here, so that question would have definitely got six marks. You can always pause the video and check out the mark scheme against the question, or you can download the mark scheme from the AQA website. Explain how phototropism in a plant shoot helps the plant to survive. While a plant that receives more light is able to carry out more photosynthesis and therefore will produce more glucose. Then the glucose can be used in plant respiration to release energy that can be used to build larger molecules from smaller molecules. The human eye can focus on objects at different distances. Figure 5 shows how a clear image of a distant object is formed in a person's eye. Well, if we look at this eye, we can see that the lens is thin. So that means that the suspensory ligaments are pulled tight that helps to pull the lens thin. And we know that that means the ciliary muscles need to be relaxed. In order to see clearly, the light rays need to converge at this focal point on the retina. Now this special part of the retina is called the fovea. Explain how the person's eye could adjust to form a clear image of a nearer object. Before we answer, let's just have a look at what needs to happen. The lens needs to bulge more so that the light can be refracted at more of an angle onto the retina, onto the fovea part of the retina. So that means that the suspensory ligaments are going to have to slacken in order to enable the lens to bulge. If the suspensory ligaments are slackening, then the ciliary muscles will contract. Don't forget that suspensory ligaments are not muscles, so they can't contract or relax. What they can do is tighten and slacken, and the ciliary muscles obviously can contract and relax, and they kind of do the opposite thing. So when the suspensory ligaments tighten, the ciliary muscles relax, and when the suspensory ligaments slacken, the ciliary muscles contract. This six marker doesn't actually require a lot of details, just really good, concise key points. The ciliary muscles contract and the suspensory ligaments slacken. This enables the lens to become fatter or more curved or bulged. Light is refracted more through the thicker lens as it is more convergent. The light rays focus on the retina and if you want to be exact, it's the fovea. Explain why a long-sighted person has difficulty seeing near objects clearly. Their eyeball may be too short or their lens can't be thickened enough. This will cause the light rays to focus behind the retina. Long-sightedness can be corrected by wearing spectacles. Describe how spectacle lenses can correct long sightedness. Well, the idea is that a lens with a convex shape can be used to refract the light rays more so that they can focus on the retina. Table two gives the classification of four plant species. Species one and three are the most closely related. What information in table two gives the evidence for this? Well, they belong to the same kingdom, the same phylum, the same class and the same order. Figure six shows the inheritance of flower color in two species of plant. 
we've got pea plants on the left and we've got snapdragon plants on the right. In pea plants and in snapdragon plants, flower colour is controlled by one pair of alleles. In figure six, the parental generation plants are homozygous for flower colour. In heterozygous pea plants, the allele for red colour is dominant. In heterozygous snapdragon plants, the alleles for flower colour are both expressed. Okay, so that last bullet point, that's a little bit of application there for AQA students anyway. Use the following symbols for alleles in your answers to question 5.2 and 5.4. So we've got capital R and little r for pea plants, we've got snapdragon. What is the genotype of the red flowered pea plants in the F1 generation? Now F1 generation means the first generation from breeding those parents together. So we know that the parents, the red will be big R, big R, and the white will be little R, little R. How do we know this? Because the information tells us that the parents are homozygous. So both of those letters will be the same. And we know that the offspring will have one allele from one parent and one allele from another parent. And so that will be big R, little r. What is the genotype of a white flowered snapdragon plant? Well, if we have a look at our snapdragons, the red is going to be CRCR and the white is going to be CWCW. They're both homozygous, so it's the same letters. And the offspring that are pink are going to be CR and C. W. So what was the question again? What is the genotype of a white flowered snapdragon plant? CWCW. A garden across two pink flowered snapdragon plants. Draw a Punnett square diagram to show why only some of the next generation plants had pink flowers. Identify the phenotypes of all the offspring plants. So what we want to do is get our parents. We know that they're pink flowers. So both parents have pink flowers. So the genotype, the letters we're going to use are CRCW. And we're going to cross that with another pink flower, CRCW. And then we'll pop the gametes into a Punnett square. So we separate them out. So we've got CR, then CW from one parent. And then CRCW from another parent. So these are the possible combinations that we could have with these options. So if CR and CR meet together and fertilize, then we get CR, 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 CW, CW, CR. Now what we do is we tend to write the R first because it comes first in the alphabet. You probably get a mark for WR, but best to go RW. And then we've got our CW, CW. Now it says to identify the phenotypes of all the offspring plants. The examiner wants to know that you've understood that CRCR is red and that CRCW is pink and that CWCW is white. So you have to be really clear there. So I've put them in the boxes. Sometimes you might want to pull it out and write it to the side. What percentage of offspring would you expect to have pink flowers? That would be, have a look, 50% because you've got two out of four. Commercially, hundreds of pink flowered snapdragon plants can be produced from one pink flowered plant. Figure seven shows a tissue culture technique used for producing many plants from one plant. So this is one of our examples of cloning in plants and the other way is by taking cuttings, if you remember. We've got the method for the tissue culture. That's nice. We don't have to remember it because it's there for us. We've got our pink flowered snapdragon plant. We need to remove a leaf. We scrape off several small groups of cells and we put those separate groups onto the agar jelly which has got nutrients and hormones in it and then we need to keep that in a sterile environment at 20 degrees c and then what will happen is we'll get a little bit of root growth and leaf growth so we'll have our little seedlings and we'll plant them in little individual plots seven pink flowered snapdragon plants which are all genetically identical to the parent plant right at the top of the diagram so the questions are give a reason for each of the following steps shown in figure seven several groups of cells are scraped off the leaf well that would be so several plants can be produced nutrients are added to the agar jelly so the plants can make proteins because they need to grow or to provide glucose for respiration to release energy because obviously they need energy for growth as well Hormones are added to the agar jelly. 
the hormones will help to stimulate cell differentiation because you've taken cells from the leaf those cells need to also differentiate multiply and differentiate enabling roots and shoots to develop the plant cells are kept in sterile conditions to prevent the growth of microorganisms that could cause disease the plant cells are kept at 20 degrees c now that is an optimum temperature for these plant enzymes to work at enabling optimum growth Explain why the method shown in figure seven produces only pink flowered plants. And it is not enough to say that there is only one parent involved. So you've got to think about how specific your language is going to be. So we could say no gametes are used. The new plants have been produced by asexual reproduction and they are all genetically identical to each other. Thanks for watching, take a little break and then watch part three and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with new content.